Makes sense. But he did not give up on us because he loved us so much. And we talked about that love last week. That, that That's the kind of love that we just cannot have but are so our own. It has to come through him. It's agape. Agape love. Well, would you like to start us out in prayer and Sir Heavenly Father, thank you for Brother Roy and that scripture reading tonight, Lord. And we just thank you that every word of your scripture is important. And there's not a word that we should overlook. And we thank you that it's alive and that every time that we look at it, we learn something new because there's just so much, there's just so much to learn in your word, Lord God. And we thank you that we have these Thursday nights that we can come together and we can study your word because like we learned last week, love is knowledge and knowledge is knowing your word and coming together and studying your word. And we just thank you that we have this opportunity. And we just thank you that when we do come together, you're right here in the midst of us. And you're the one that's really in charge, Lord. And it's your word that's going out. And we just pray that you will use your word to touch somebody's heart. Lord, you, you can, if there's five of us here tonight, you can use your word to touch each person in a different way, the same word. And it's just so amazing and just so beautiful. And Father God, I just thank you and I praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Okay, so last week we looked at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and we uh, talked about the fruit of the Spirit. And... Uh, we said that the fruit of the spirit is love and we said that that love is in the singular so love is made up of joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness and self-control and it's just amazing amazing agape love and tonight we're looking at galatians 5 25 which says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. I once heard somebody say that the problem with life is that it's just too daily. A lot of people seem to look at their lives and think that their lives are just too mundane and too unexciting, just too predictable. I don't know who it was, and I can't remember where I read it, but um, someplace I read where I read I read a, a book that uh, the writer said in there that uh, in his situation, his life was like a merry-go-round without the merry. And that's not the way that the life for a believer is supposed to be lived. Paul just said it here in Galatians 5.25. But you know the if part, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit, is more properly transferred, translated, I mean, since you live in the spirit, walk in the spirit. So it's almost like a command. But what does it mean to walk in the spirit? And we're going to look at three different men tonight that were really walking in the spirit and we're going to see what we can learn from them one of them of course the apostle paul one is peter and then one will be philip walking in the spirit is the most exciting interesting wonderful way that we can live it, it's the direct opposite of routine drudgery and predictability so we're just going to look at these couple of guys who walked in the spirit, beginning, like I said, with the one who wrote this verse, the Apostle Paul, and see what we can learn from them. Now in Acts 16, 
As he was getting ready to set out on his second missionary journey, Paul and Silas, along with a young man named Timothy, headed for Asia in order to check on the churches that they had planted there during Paul's first missionary journey. In verse 6 of that chapter, however, the Spirit suddenly closes a door and prevents them from accomplishing what they had set out to do. Changing their plans, they headed for Bithynia. But once again, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to proceed. So it was that Paul found himself in the seacoast town of Troas. In Acts 16, verses 6 to 8, we read, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And in mind's eye, I, I can... Uh, my mind's eye envisioned Paul just pacing back and forth with his back to the sea, up and down the beach, questioning himself, wondering, and just wrestling, you know, what are you doing, Lord? I thought I was supposed to come here to visit the churches that I had started in my first missionary journey. And now I'm down here in Troas. It's just, what, what, what are you doing? And then, Suddenly, he had a vision of a man from Macedonia saying to him, come and help us. So it was that although the thought of taking the gospel to Europe had never before occurred to Paul, and the company set sail across the Aegean Sea for Greece. Upon their arrival, their journey having taken them to Philippi, the chief city of the region, they met with a group of women in verse 13, it tells us, for evidently there was not a male believer around. Paul was expecting to find a Macedonian man because that's what he saw in his vision. Instead, he found a group of women, a group of godly women. That's the way it is when we walk in the spirit. Doors will close unexpectedly. Others will open miraculously. But when we go through them, things are rarely how we ever thought they would be initially. While the Macedonian man does indeed appear as the chapter unfolds, he could hardly have been the one who Paul thought he would be. So just who was the Macedonian man? I believe that he was the jailer who put Paul in the stocks before himself coming to a saving faith in Jesus. In Acts 16, 30 through 34, we read, So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately him and all of his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. So only believe to the Philippian jailer who wanted to know what he had to do to be saved, Paul answered. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Now you notice here that Paul didn't say, well, if you'll join our church, you can be saved. He didn't give him a list of rules and the rule regulations and say, if you follow these rules and regulations, you will be saved. He didn't lay a guilt trip on him. He just said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Is it possible it is that simple? Is it possible we have complicated the matter by adding so many other requirements? Is it possible God will save a person by their simple belief in Jesus Christ? Well, that was what Paul told us. 
And this is exciting to me. Prison doors opening, churches starting, the miracles abounding. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit. Letting the Holy Ghost close doors, open others, and surprise us at every turn. Now we're going to take a little bit of a look at Peter. In Acts chapter 10, we find Peter on Simon the Tanner's rooftop waiting for his lunch. And as he was looking out over the Mediterranean Sea, Peter saw a sheep carrying all sorts of unclean animals descend from heaven. And he heard the voice of the Lord saying, forget this kosher, unkosher stuff, Peter. I'm instituting a new system. Here, enjoy this piece of bacon. Help yourself to a couple of pigs in a blanket. The law given to drive you to Christ has done its job. And now you're free, Peter. Peter was taken aback by this, and so he went downstairs to find three men at the door, just as the Spirit had promised. Because in Acts 10, 19, it says, While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. And accompanying them to the house of Cornelius, Peter preached the word there. And the entire household of Cornelius was radically converted. So I'm certain that when Peter first arrived at Simon the Tanner's house, the last thing he dreamed that he would be doing was to be chowing down on a bacon burger. But before preaching to a family of Gentiles. But like Paul, as Peter walked in the spirit, he was led to people and places beyond his wildest expectations. And now we're going to take a little bit of a look at Philip. But we're going to have to back up a couple more chapters to do that. We back up to chapter 8 in the book of Acts. And here we see the entire city of Samaria responding to the ministry of another who walked in the spirit. His name, Philip. Demons were fleeing. Souls were being saved. Joy was filling the entire community when suddenly the Lord said to Philip, leave this revival now, which is affecting tens of thousands of people, and go out into the desert. That's Acts chapter 8, and verses 26 to 27. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So Philip arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. And because he was walking in the spirit, Philip went, most likely not understanding why, but being obedient. When he reached Gaza, the spirit prompted him to talk to a certain political leader from Ethiopia who returning from Jerusalem was sitting in that chariot reading the book of Isaiah, as I said. Now, what did Philip do? Did he walk over towards the chariot? No. Scripture tells us that Philip ran to the man in the chariot. That's in Acts 8, verse 30. After receiving the gospel from Philip, the Ethiopian asked to be baptized immediately, a quest to which Philip complied and eagerly. Notice that when the, the Spirit told Philip to go to the man in a chariot, Philip didn't hesitate. He didn't walk over slyly. He ran to that chariot, eagerly to obey the Spirit. I wish that I was more like Philip. When the Lord places an impression on my heart or puts a thought in my mind, how I want to respond, not begrudgingly or reluctantly, but just to run like Philip did. 
being completely obedient to the spirit. Go to the desert, the spirit had said. So Philip went. He didn't know why. He was obedient. He just went to the desert. And the single conversation which took place in that desert still has ramifications some 2,000 years later as the light of the good news of salvation continues to shine out in Africa. Everybody just look at Paul called to Macedonia unpredictably. Peter going into the house of Cornelius where he never thought he would be. Philip being called to the desert seemingly confusingly and you'll see that each man walked in the spirit. And if you're like me at all, you're thinking, I just like to walk in the spirit, but I don't get visions from Macedonia. I don't see sheets dropping down from heaven. And I don't hear a voice telling me to run to Gaza. I agree in theory that life should be exciting and meaningful, impacting and spirit led but how does this happen practically? I suggest that there are three ways. The first one being request. And Jesus gave us the first key to walking in the spirit when he told us in Luke 11 verse nine, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you. It's interesting to me that those verbs in the Greek, ask, seek, knock, are in the perfect tense, which denotes a continual asking, a continual seeking, and a continual knocking. It's not something we do once a week in church or once a month when we're on the mountaintop or just once a week on Thursday evening. It's what we do all day long. As, as we be. say, Lord, I need your help. I want to be used by you. Give me your sensitivity to your spirit. That doesn't take long. You can say that while you're driving. You can say that under your breath while you're cooking. You can say that at any time, but it's a continual thing that we have to do. The next thing is to relax. If the first step to walking in the spirit is to request, the second step is to relax. Just take a look at Samuel 9, where we find Saul looking for his father's donkeys. Unable to find the lost livestock, Saul was about to return to his father empty-handed when he heard about a man of God who could help him. And making his way to the prophet Samuel's house, Saul inquired of him concerning the lost herd. Samuel said, set not your mind on donkeys. Come to my table. There is a far bigger issue at hand here. You are about to be made king of Israel. That's 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 20. And you know what, folks? I think that we are Saul. Bunches of us are searching high and low for our lost donkeys, desiring to come to our Father with something of substance in our lives. We nonetheless, we wander aimlessly and we turn empty-handed. We struggle with a job. We struggle with a house, a career. We struggle with a relationship. But as important as those things might be, they're only donkeys in comparison to the bigger issue which is the kingdom of God. The Lord is calling us to significant service, to touch people's lives, to impact our world. Thus the Lord says to us, set not your mind on donkeys. I know right where they are. You don't have to tell me. You don't have to worry about them. I know where they are. Instead, you come to my table and you fellowship with me. And finally, we are to receive. 
Now, what happened when Saul went to Samuel's table? First, Samuel said, Stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Then he anointed Saul king. That's Samuel 10, verse 1. And then lastly, in verse 2, he told Saul where his father's donkeys could be found. So do you want to walk in the spirit? Then you do what Saul did. Forget about donkeys. Set aside your own agenda and commune with the Lord at his table. Chew on his word and stand still in his presence and receive his anointing. Then like Saul, you will be told where to find your lost donkeys. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. It's just that simple. In the morning hours, during the day, on Thursday night, Sunday evening, and Sunday morning, seek first the kingdom of God. And not only will you be anointed by the Spirit with significant opportunities opening before you, but you will find that you will, were looking for them all along. Because there becomes a sensitivity that you will gather to listen to the Spirit as you draw closer and closer to God. Father God, we first want to praise you for who you are. Yes, Lord. You are the God most high. You Amen. are the Alpha and Omega. You are the beginning and you are the end. Yes, Lord. You are the creator of all that is from all that never was. And most astoundingly, as Brother Roy read in the scriptures tonight, you loved us and loved us while we were still at enmity with you. You loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son into this world to die for our sins that we might have eternal life. Yes, Lord. Last week we talked about your agape love. And we found that it is a love that is impossible for us to achieve. It's a love that is made up of joy, and peace, long suffering, gentleness, and goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Your love just amazes us, Father. And you also showed us last week that the secret of life is to bear fruit. Yes, Lord. And you showed us that the secret of bearing fruit is to abide in Jesus Christ. And you told us that the secret of abiding is to be obedient. And the secret of obedience is to love. And the secret of love is knowledge. Yes. And the secret of knowledge is to study your word, just like we're doing tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you will open our eyes as we look into your word tonight and see three men who are examples of us walking in the spirit. I pray that you bless this time for us, Lord, and bless your word to our understanding. Yes, Lord. And I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.